welcome back traders uh, with me I have um, a very exciting guest to talk about some stocks and an industry uh, sector that I'm extremely um, passionate about and, and watch very closely uh, with me is Rich Tulo from uh, he's a researcher at um, Albert Freed and Company uh, Rich good morning and happy Monday hey how are you thank you for having me on all right, let's jump right into it here, and, and I want to uh, kind of get some plays of uh, some tickers. So everyone, you know, definitely, you know, keep your ear here and, and pipe in questions for Rich into the chat as we're talking about some of these companies. Uh, Rich, can you first give me um, your overall view with uh, kind of um, the, how the whole sector is playing out? I'm talking about TiVo, Comcast, Netflix. We obviously have some Comcast uh, news uh, of recent, and Netflix always being in um, our, our, our eye. Can you talk about you know what's your whole view on the sector and how the companies are all playing out? Okay, so our fundamental long-term view is that the uh, television industry at large, right, that includes programmers and uh, the cable companies, uh, some people call them MSOs or uh, MVPDs, uh, are going to uh, are in a uh, point of conversion, right? So this year. Uh, we're seeing uh, content uh, go from purely a linear type of uh, stream uh, supported by video on demand, and we're seeing new products with the called next generation television uh, roll out onto the cable systems. The, one of the first of those products, obviously, uh, coming from the cable providers is uh, Xfinity, uh, and uh, Netflix, Hulu, uh, Amazon Prime are the uh, over the top, uh, you know. Uh, you know, versions of those products. And um, so what we think is is that this uh, convergence is going to drive a lot of decisions, uh, both on the M&A front and the strategic front, uh, for, for the industry. So when you say, I mean, obviously the convergence, you, you know, it's pretty clear that could happen. What what kind of, um, I mean, are you talking about Netflix getting acquired or, or what are some of the strategic plays that you guys uh, have your eye on? Well, uh, I mean, right now uh, Comcast uh, is uh, in the process of acquiring Time Warner Cable, uh, and we think that's a very clear uh, deal that is being driven in, in part uh, by this convergence. Um, you know, both companies need to get to scale uh, in order to, to compete with, uh, to purchase content better, uh, and uh, and and really more importantly, amortize this great investment in new technologies across a larger base of, of customer accounts, right? So you're not able to do things at, let's say, uh, 700,000 subscribers uh, for small uh, MSO, uh, but, you know, at 30 million, you can roll out some pretty interesting technology to your subscribers, and I think that's in part uh, the rationale behind the Comcast uh, Time Warner decision. So I read an article this morning saying, does Netflix Incorporated win or lose with the Comcast deal? What does this mean for companies like Netflix and Hulu? Well, I mean, I think ultimately uh, what this deal says to me is uh, in combination with the recent court decision is that uh, peering of Internet streaming content uh, is going to be an evolution uh, just like the appearing of internet uh, um, text content was uh, for the you know for the telephone companies, and we're going to see uh, probably more uh, arrangements like Netflix has with Comcast uh, in terms of uh, them having uh, if they want to provide a higher quality level of service uh, to Netflix subs, um, you know then Netflix is going to have to pay for that, and they can't rely uh, solely on Comcast. Uh, to be uh, subsidizing uh, that service uh, for the Netflix uh, subscribers that they have, you know, when roughly in, in, in any of these systems, about two thirds of the subscribers don't subscribe to Netflix or any of the over-the-top services. So it's it's basically a fair allocation uh, of costing. And you know, the derivative play we like in this is TiVo because most of the carriage agreements, the agreements that bring TV from a programmer like CBS onto your cable system uh, essentially prohibit the cable system from uh, providing that content video on demand basis or over the top basis separate uh, from the agreement that they would have with CBS, which means uh, that if you like under the dome, uh, Netflix can't provide that to you if uh, on Comcast, if Comcast is, is delivering that to your set-top box as it states right now. Uh, so we think the way around that 
is TiVo because TiVo boxes uh, in the Comcast system are purchased by the customer, and so the customer can do whatever they want. And uh, we think that is uh, perhaps a roadmap uh, for the future. And the idea uh, that Comcast is going from uh, 23 million subs uh, in markets that may not necessarily uh, support uh, TiVo uh, owing to demographics um, to 30 million subs with incremental ad is in New York and L.A. Uh, and Dallas. You know, we like that idea a lot. So, you know, I have these moments of uh, clarity, I guess, when I'm thinking about trading ideas. And mine came for this industry uh, probably a few months back. I'm sitting in an airport and listening to a few dads talk about um, getting rid of cable. And the one guy's talking about his bill on, at, with Comcast stuff at like $180 a month or whatever it is. And the other guy's, well, right. I got Hulu and Netflix, and it's costing me $17 a month. And the only thing I really need is basic right. cable for my, for my sports teams. Um, you right. know, we talk about uh, consolidation of this industry coming to fruition. Do you do you see um, in your research a and, and anyone in the chat? Does who in the chat ha- has cable or does not have cable? And if you don't have cable, what do you use? So pipe in the chat. Okay. I'd, I'd love to I'd love to know um, see what our, our users are doing. But are you seeing that kind of move right now? And uh, you know, are, are the are the cable companies worried? Okay. So what you're talking about, we would define as cord cutting. Um, we do not believe in cord cutting as such. Uh, what we think is going to be the case is uh, what we call cord splicing, where people who are going to limit uh, the number of services available uh, that they take from the cable company. Uh, so they'll take broadband and telephone uh, and may not take uh, the TV service, right? Or uh, they may take the TV service and they may not take um, buy as much on video on demand when new movies come out because they have a Hulu or Amazon Prime account or a Netflix account. All right, so we call that cord cutting. Um, in you know, and then a direct relationship uh, with TiVo is uh, another version of cord cutting is going from having three or four set top boxes in the home and getting charged X amount of dollars uh, per each box, and and maybe you know you you get rid of all those set top boxes. And you have one TiVo box that streams the content to the rest of the TV sets or devices in the home. Uh, so, you know, ultimately we think that's probably where the biggest impact uh, of the consumer making decisions around technology uh, that's going to face the cable company is, is not necessarily getting rid of TV, uh, but uh, more uh, in line with uh, limiting the amount of services because the value proposition of the linear TV account, it's pretty high. Um, you know, in order to replace uh, everything uh, that you get on TV uh, with Apple TV on, on a digital download basis, you'd have to pay about $6,000 a year more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, on a, a like-for-like uh, basis uh, with cord cutting, um, you know, really you may be saving 4 or $5 a month after everything. Uh, but ultimately, you don't wind up saving a lot because you, you wind up buying uh, more over-the-top services. And, and, you know, to replace your sports, you have to, you know, buy an NFL Sunday ticket or the MLB. And, you know, and, and, the, and those packages are not cheap. And, and very often they don't offer your home games in your home market. So Ace, Ace of Stocks inside the chat room just nailed it. And it's the same thing that I did downgraded my cable to basic only and use Netflix. And that's mm-hmm. that's essentially what I do too. Um, obviously, Amazon trying to become a player in this space. But before we get to that, uh, talking Netflix, um, you know, I am a huge fan of House of Cards. It is, you know, right. I love Kevin Spacey. The show is just phenomenal. But then I read that they only signed him for a third season and they're in jeopardy of losing that. And I think they're, correct me if I'm wrong, paying between 75 and $100 million for the third season. Is that correct? I, I think it's a, a probably in that range, and, and uh, because really they got they they got Netflix. So how? Uh, here's a question I have: How does Netflix? Because obviously I'm not paying specifically for House of Cards, even though it's pretty much all I watch on there. How do they uh, gauge the level of success with that kind of spend for those shows? And is that attainable over time with the amount of subscribers they have? Well, it's. I think we don't cover Netflix any, anymore. Let me be clear. I'm short the stock personally. Let me be clear. Um, valuation reasons. Uh, I think 
Uh, but to be honest and be frank, I think, you know, when you talk about Netflix and its originals, it's really a tale of two cities. Um, House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, uh, two forms of programming content uh, that can play with anybody, anywhere. All right, so I think it would be successful on HBO or AMC. Uh, and, and, you know, it perhaps and, uh, you know, Netflix is actually not the best platform to maximize revenue for those uh, programming points, but, you know, that, that is what it is. Uh, Netflix doesn't provide um, Wall Street with uh, metrics, uh, but, you know, we assume that House of Cards has had a very uh, successful return on investment. Uh, we think of the $6 million, uh, subscribers added last year. Uh, roughly uh, two thirds, a half of those subscribers are added uh, from uh, customer retention, right? Not losing customers they normally would have lost, and adding, uh, and then the other three million are, are pure ads. Uh, so, you know, when you kind of look at that churn rate going from about six percent a month to about three percent a month uh, throughout the whole year 2013, uh, you know, we think that's in large part driven by House of Cards, Orange is New Black. Um, that said. This is a company that's going to spend roughly $700 million in 2014 on original content, of which House of Cards, Orange and New Black, about 25% of that, mm-hmm. less than that, right? And so, you know, we're, you know, where we see the value being destroyed is in uh, Hemlock Grove, uh, Turbo FAST, uh, Make a Mermaid, I mean, all these shows that you never heard of that you don't love. Uh, and so they got two ten bowls that cost them $700 million. And, you know, you kind of contrast and compare that to AMC, which got about four tent poles that cost them $150 million, right? And so, uh, you know, we don't think it's a very efficient model, uh, but they do have two successful shows. All right. And what are your final thoughts on the Comcast? I know we just touched on it. The Comcast and Netflix relationship. What would be the ideal outcome uh, from this relationship? Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, what you see is, is – um, you know, Netflix, uh, after their earnings call, uh, would, you know, kind of, you know, backtrack, you know, on a lot of the commentary they made about net neutrality, saying they were going to fight it, uh, saying it wasn't good for the consumer, uh, saying that they didn't need it, uh, saying they didn't need uh, MSO relationships to deliver high, high definition uh, streaming into the home. And, you know, this, this deal kind of usurps a lot of that. Um, you know, the question that, that we'll find out later in the year for Netflix is, are they paying Comcast roughly $25 million incrementally uh, for the peering? Or are they, you know, receiving some cost savings elsewhere? And this is, you know, 10 to $15 million out of pocket. Um, you know, we'll have to wait and see on that. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, what this uh, deal does show is that Netflix has to uh, doesn't have the economies of scale as, as a company uh, that a lot of Wall Street thinks it has because now they have to spend money uh, with Comcast in order to deliver uh, you know the content at a high level of quality to uh, a growing subscriber base and and I think Wall Street was kind of thinking that um, they'd be able to get her done uh, with three million three billion dollars a year, uh, and uh, that's not the case. And to spend more money on content, they're going to spend more money on the distribution of that content. That's a great point. Economies of scale for Netflix. You know, they're they're playing in a whole new ball game as they start producing or uh, creating their own movies, so uh, or TV shows, uh, I should say. And well, they don't really create. They're, they're uh, you know, uh, facilitators let me, more, right? Let, let me be clear. CBS doesn't create a lot of its own content. AMC doesn't create a lot of its own content. But they're buying the content from the studios, right? Mm-hmm. So, so, and they're buying defined licenses from the studios. So they don't have the evergreen asset that AMC has with Walking Dead, right? So when The Walking Dead is off the air, AMC will make money off of The Walking Dead uh, between now and the end of time, all right, on the syndication market, on video on demand market, digital download, all that. Uh, once AMC's relationship with Sony sunsets after the third season, Sony will own House of Cards. Mm-hmm. All right, Netflix did not produce House of Cards. Netflix just bought the show as a person who buys trucks would buy lease a truck. Mm-hmm. Okay, they don't own the truck; they leased it. 
That's a right? solid Which point. Which is a different set of economics. That's a solid point is the residuals are, are not there like you would see on. There's on no other. residuals. Yep. There's no residuals. So moving, moving on from Netflix here in, in the Comcast, um, before we um, wrap up here, wh- what are your thoughts on current streaming devices like Roku, Apple TV, Chromecast, and the like? Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's actually very interesting in that they're all kind of uh, carving out little defined niches in the market, right? Uh, Apple TV in its current reiteration uh, is largely supporting Apple devices and, and, and feeding off the Apple ecosystem, which is not a bad place to be. It's successful. Um, Roku, uh, I think, is, is a terribly good platform, and it's a, it's a great platform uh, because it's uh, not really – a streaming device as such, right? It's a good streaming device, but it's really a marketplace for apps uh, coming to the TV set. And I think that's a, that's a terribly interesting business. Uh, and I think the TiVo device um, won't be able to compete with the Roku or Google uh, on, a, on a price basis. But, you know, where we see TiVo Romeo on a, on a look forward basis, and we've said this publicly many times, is that it's uh, you know really the TV equivalent of IMAX or or Bose, where it's a uh, their retail uh, product is a high end uh, service to the home uh, for people willing to pay for that service, just as people pay for Bose stereo equipment and people pay for uh, extra when they go to movies to see IMAX motion picture. And then um, uh, pulling up here, Apple and Google, obviously two players in the space. Apple down 0.43% here in the pre-market trading. Um, so general outlook for 2014, you know, obviously consolidation is, is on your radar. Any other, any other uh, main points from your research uh, for the industry and the sector? Okay. Uh, this has more to do with the uh, ad agencies we cover, uh, but we are not as bullish as our peers. And the reason why we're not as bullish as our peers is that a lot of the economic indicators – uh, have been breaking down since the fourth quarter of 2013. A lot of that's due to the weather. But we've also noticed in our work that um, in each year since the end of the recession, that the U.S. economy has been getting a push uh, from essentially three sources, uh, retail housing investment, IP, and uh, uh, technolo- technology investment. And, and, and what we've seen and what we've noticed the last uh, four years is that uh, big pickups in those forms of investment have pushed the economy uh, for growth for the rest of the year. Now, this could be the weather or maybe not the weather, but if the push is not as great for the back half of the year as the, you know, as the front part would indicate, uh, then we think the economy is a little bit uh, is very much fairly valued, and then investors have to be a little bit careful chasing valuation in here. Uh, but th- that's not to say that there's, you know, there's no investment opportunities. Just is you have to be careful and, and, you know, look at things that are maybe longer term in nature uh, that have a, a more tangible value. All right, that is uh, um, Rich Tulo, director of research at Albert Fried and Company. Uh, Rich, what, what's your Twitter handle so I can put it into the chat to uh, have people follow? Oh, you, you know what, um, Southside Alice, uh, and and you know, unfortunately, I'd love to do it, uh, but I I don't have the uh, compliance infrastructure to handle Twitter you. Uh, at the moment. The man's keeping uh, but, you down, Rich. Yeah, the man's it's, keeping it's unfortunate. him down. <laughs> yeah. All right, Rich, well, I really I'd appreciate. Like, I'd love you. to do it, but it's just you know. It's the man keeping me down. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right, Rich. Well, really appreciate you coming on the show this morning. That's Rich Tulo, Director of Research at Albert Fried and Company. Um, Rich is always uh, interested in, uh, with us discussing Comcast, TiVo, Netflix, everything that's going on in that sector and the like. So, Rich, thanks a lot. Hope you have a great Monday here. Uh, up next. Oh.